Well, here we go, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Gridiron and Growth Podcast. I am your co-host, Benny Fowler, with my other co-host, Ryan Harris, Super Bowl champion. And today we have a special guest, Zaw Thet. Zaw is a new friend of mine and now a new friend of Ryan. Zaw is an incredible entrepreneur. He is the youngest person to graduate from Stanford Business School, serial entrepreneur, investor, all around great guy. He is a Packers fan, even though he has on a San Francisco 49er hoodie. Zaw, can you t- tell us a little bit about why you have on the San Francisco 49er hoodie today? Oh, well, you know, that was a that was a game last night, I'll tell you what. And uh, I was telling Ryan, so I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm a diehard Packers fan. Uh, bo- you know, just bleed cheese, basically. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> But uh, one of my boys from way, way back is Prague, who's the president of 49ers Enterprises and has been with the team for 23 years. So I felt like after the win yesterday, I had to give him his flowers. And he gave me this when I was out there a couple of weeks ago, you know, going to the to the Rams game because um, I didn't have any Niners gear. And he's like, well, if you're going to be in the in the box, you got to wear Niners gear. I'm like, all right, sure enough. Um, so. <laughs> The price you price pay, you, pay. Right? Okay. <laughs> you know, it's free food and you got to wear Niners gear. So, and good seats. So I got to give him his flowers and I'm just hoping, you know, I'm open for his sake. He's been with the team for 23 years that, you know, this is the year that he gets his chip. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's long overdue for him. And I know you two uh, obviously have, uh, have been there and done that and, and gotten yours. And so I'm just hoping for him, for his sake, that he gets his. We will see. We will see. But Zah, now this 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 conversation is is all about you, my friend. And you know, I just love the connectivity of, of Denver, Colorado, and just the world. And you obviously know about the connectivity of in terms of being an entrepreneur and building incredible companies in Silicon Valley, and then now being the CEO of Exer. Um, but Zah, let's let's start. Like, where do you want to start in terms of sharing a little bit about your story and your journey um, in terms of building companies, in terms of I mean, being the youngest graduate of Stanford Business School, I mean, that's still, it's insane when I when I talk Crazy. about it out loud. Um, so where do you want to start in terms of sharing that? Oh, I, I'd i say let's let's start with the failures more than the successes, <laughs> you know? Yeah, okay. there we okay. go. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think everyone paints a rosy picture. Um, and there's obviously, I've been very blessed in life and, uh, you know, obviously I've worked hard for all that, but you know, to me, I think it's uh, Winston Churchill said it best. He's uh, and actually, I don't know if this is a real quote attributed to him, but I've said it this way for a couple of years, so I'll, I'll just say it: that you know, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And yeah, <laughs> I mean yeah. that applies to everything, right? Not just business, but sports and sports and business, everything in life, really, in general, kind of tied together. And so when when I look at when I look back on my career so far. Hopefully, I'm still in the prime of of what I do. That um, you know, it's a, a lot of learning lessons along the way. So, as I was saying, I, I grew up in Wisconsin. I came out to Stanford uh, as an undergrad in 1998 during the first dot com boom, and man, things were crazy back then. I mean, it was it was to the point where I think at one point, 20 percent of the dorm and then the house that I lived in had dropped out of Stanford to go start a company. Uh, this was 1999. So that's when I got my start. I uh, was building search engines in 1999. Um, Google had just come come out. <laughs> that's how old I am. <laughs> Crazy. Hey, show us the encyclopedia books. Oh, I, come on, man. Where they at, man? You know what? You go to my parents' house in, in, in Madison, there's still a whole bookshelf of those encyclopedia Britannicas that, yeah. you know, someone... <laughs> Probably we use for every book report, every right? Book report, <laughs> you know, it all read the same thing because everyone was like, "Okay, well, I, I got to write about the Crusades. I'm going to look it up," and there, you know, or or go to the library. There was no internet. It's crazy. My my kids think I'm absolutely crazy. Though. I'm like, they're like, "What do you mean? You had you you turned the TV with a dial?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I did. Sorry, I'm going to be that yeah. old guy now." So let, let's we'll fast forward it all. So I did I did a bunch of startups uh, and then. You know the the first. Wait, wait! I don't want you to first. fast forward because I want you. I don't want you to fast forward. I want you to talk about because I know. I mean, when we first met, you dropped out of Stanford too. I did. Um, yeah. And would you tell your and would you tell your parents? Oh, <laughs> Young- <laughs> Ooh, 
they were not. You're stronger than me, bro. I woo, it, couldn't do it. It was, uh, that was one of the rougher conversations, you know, uh, in, I've, I've had in my life. In, in the end, it was great, but, um, it was, it was Thanksgiving of my sophomore year, Stanford. And so my parents are immigrants. So they, they came from Burma, um, in the early seventies, got out of all the craziness when the military took over the junta and, and all this stuff. And so they, you know, they came to this country literally with like $7 a piece in their pockets because that's all the government would let them take out. They were both doctors, all my aunts and uncles and everyone in my family is basically was physicians or people that could, had, got out. So they're, they're classmates. So my aunties and uncles, right, who are not blood, but they worked their whole life to get their eldest kid. I have a younger sister as well, who also went to Stanford. So, but um, whole life to get their eldest kid into into you know uh, a school like like Stanford. And then I come home and I'm like, yeah, I'm dropping out of school. <laughs> it was not the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, they, I remember sitting around the, their little, you know, dining room, kitchen table, and uh, I was sweating. I was like, "Oh, this is going to be really bad." But I'd already made up my mind, and uh, they were actually very supportive, though. Um, back then, at least, you could go back, so you could take a leave of absence. So that's the way I pitched it: was that I'm going to take a leave of absence. I got to go do this startup. This is a great opportunity, and who knows if it'll happen again? <laughs> Didn't know I was going to be doing it for the next 25 years. Um, but I got to go try. And, um, you know, they, they were, they were not super happy, uh, to start, but I think in the end they were, they were very supportive. And then obviously I did go back and, and I did finish and I did go straight into to business school. So, um, it, it all worked out in the end. Was that moment like, I mean, you're at Stanford, you're leaving Stanford. And I, I said, thank God I didn't take my visit there. Cause that campus is gorgeous. Yes, I mean, gorgeous. my mm -hmm. goodness. But you're in this place of higher, not even just a higher institution. This is a highway to success. How could a startup pull you away from an institution of success like that at Stanford? Like, What were the pieces where you're like, I have to do this, as you just said? It may be something because I'm, I'm going to use this line as we talk later about my career. There's, there's just certain things that come up that I say in, in Xer. Uh, which we'll, we'll come to in the end, which is what I'm working on now, is one of those things where I was just like, you know what? I have to go do this. I really, if I don't do it, I'm going to regret it. And I would rather try and fail than not have tried at all. Um, and that is something that has stuck with me throughout my career. And so I knew at least for Stanford, right? Like amazing institution, great people, a lot better weather than Wisconsin. Um <laughs> I was like palm trees. We mean they had palm trees. Uh, I thought yeah. those were only in Hawaii. No, I, I knew a little bit better than that. But uh, you know, they there was just this, uh, this amazing opportunity to go build something. And I'm I'm a, I'm a builder, right? Like whether that be building relationships, whether that be building companies, whether that's building products. Like I just I love to build stuff. And here was this great opportunity to go build a company and learn on the fly. And so that's why I, I said I'm going I'm going to go try. All right. So now you've exited, you've exited Stanford, taken a leave of absence. Let's talk about the startup journey, your first startup journey and the companies that you were a part of. And then when you got your first big break in terms of a company that scaled, let's dive uh, into that. Yeah. So the, I, look, the, I was 19 years old when I started my first company. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> like literally I was reading, this is like back to Encyclopedia Botanica. There was no like websites for this. There was no newsletters. I remember I got, um, I have it somewhere in a, in a box somewhere. It was a, uh, an entrepreneur, a startup, uh, something about a, a startup guide uh, for entrepreneurs uh, for, for law. And so it was this one book that basically broke down how to think about raising money and what giving stock was like and how to, how to write it, what a term sheet was and what a valuation was and, uh, some accounting. <laughs> I still <laughs> wish I had paid better attention to accounting, even in business school. And so it was just this, it was just learn on the fly. That's what it was. And meeting a lot of people being, um, you know, some people, you know, when they start companies, they're super secretive and they don't like to talk about them. And to me, you know, um, it, I've always found it better to just be open with everyone, describe both the what's going right and what's going wrong. And to, it's, it, it's really about execution. Yes, you might have a piece of technology or a piece of IP that makes it 
so no one else can copy it. But really, in the end, right? Like, let's just fast forward into the to the social networking era. There was Friendster, and there was MySpace, and there was Tribe before there was Facebook, right? And before there was TikTok and Twitter, even. And so it really isn't wasn't about the idea; it was about the execution, and that's something that I've I've uh, I've always done. So, full circle. The first one for me was just a learning journey. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I had a lot of people that believed and were willing to, at that point, just write a check. Uh, thankfully, we returned uh, money back to them, but the company, you know, didn't, it didn't go anywhere. I mean, we were we we sold it for pieces, and um, I went back to school. So that was the that was the first run. What's the execution piece you think people miss the most when building a company? You know, I think it's team. I really do. You know, if you don't have the right people around you. And look, I, you know, I've been through every journey um, as a founder, obviously a CEO, then also as an investor into other companies. Um, and I call it like an investor is really like, to me, I felt like I was doing CEO therapy all the time. <laughs> so it's just talking to them about their problems, like someone that could relate to them that had been through the same things that they'd been through. And so I think if I had to break down as a, as a founder and as a CEO, that you really have only a couple of really key responsibilities. If you do these, everything else kind of falls into line. So first one is you always got to make sure there's cash in the bank, right? Like you don't want, you, you don't want your, you going out of business. So that's number one priority, right? The second one is set the vision uh, and the objectives for the company. Don't try and get in too much into the minutia, but set a clear vision, set a clear set of objectives and goals so that people understand the direction that they're going. And so if you get hit by a bus, or you're out for travel for a week, there's not people asking you every minute, what should I be doing? That's, that's bad. You know, the third is always be selling. And so, you know, I'm a big believer in a founder led sales model where you start out and like you're getting market feedback. And the only way you're going to get feedback is by talking to your customers, whether those be consumers, whether those be businesses, whether in our case now, whether it's like doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, I want to be on the front lines understanding their problems. But then you're also selling to investors. You're also selling to press. And then the last one is you're always selling to, to potential team members. And so th those are the big ones. And then the last one is, is set the culture, right? And understand from very early on, like, what are your principles going to be? I have a, a, a story that I get into, but just thinking about, like, what are the, the leadership qualities that you want to have in, in people that you're hiring? Some of them may need to have more. Some of them may need to have less, but be better at other things. And setting that culture of accountability is, is I think really important. If you do those things and you fail, you at least try, right? Like you, you've set the groundwork the right way. Uh, but I think a lot of people miss on many of those and end up flailing or in situations where they get a lot of churn and turnover where the company just doesn't make it, which is a lot of startups, unfortunately. Number one, those are, those are great. And I believe great yeah. companies and sports teams have all of those. My question to you, especially in terms of startups, founders, are how do I keep track of all of that? Is there a checklist or do you do I have to write these things down to make sure I check these things every single day? What's the cadence I should do this? Because, I mean, leadership is simple, but it's hard to execute. And it's a small word for a big job. And I agree with everything that you just said, but how do you do it in a startup? And you talked about the importance of team. How do I do that when I'm just getting this company off the ground and I can't pay anybody? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. Especially, especially at that level when you're, you're just starting out and you're getting people to believe in a vision. Right. And so to me, at least that's why I've always been really drawn to companies that are mission driven. And so by that, I mean, there's some greater purpose that this company is serving. So this is not to knock accounting software, but like if I'm building accounting software that is going to, you know, save someone 5% on their, I don't know, inventory, you know, and, you know, cash flow. getting a bunch of people to believe in that really early on is something that's going to like make a difference in the world is difficult, right? Once you get to be big enough, you get enough customers and revenue. Sure. That's a different thing, but the early days, it's all about mission, right? And if you have a company or something that you're working on that is, has that potential to be so impactful, that is, I think, a really key distinguishing factor. And, and it's the one that I tend to over-index on, whether it's starting companies or investing in companies. Well, I'm glad for many reasons that we got you on today, because 
I don't know if you know this, but 78% of former NFL players end up broke and or divorced or chemically dependent. And Benny and I have seen it, which is guys get advice from people or ideas from people, everything from I, I was offered a company that would sell the the milk for, drained from Fruit Loops and Cocoa Puffs for people to drink, right? And all these things. Like you can, you name it, Benny and I, every NFL player has had the business pitch. But what we didn't ever learn was what do you pay attention to in a business plan? Like what's important when somebody brings me a business plan, right? What's important to look at? First, my thing is, is did you take this to the bank? Like that's something that I learned to say. Like, <laughs> how come a bank won't do this with you, mm-hmm. right? And then we know that eventually it gets into other opportunities, but – so many guys go broke on an idea that sounds good, but they don't know what they're looking at. What are the keys to looking at a good business plan to determine whether or not it's a sustainable investment for an individual? Well, so uh, I'll put my investor hat back on for a second. So, um, uh, yeah, I've, I've unfortunately, I've seen this firsthand. And, and I also see it just in, in talking to, you know, former athletes that are getting, you know, that obviously – have done really well in their lives and, and, you know, got some, got some chips in the bank account and, you know, people are just coming after them, right. Whether left, left, right and center. And unless you have a business team, right. Or your own office or family office, which obviously you guys are working on, then it's really difficult to evaluate all these opportunities, right. Cause what is it? And so I started a shop called Signia, which is a, um, now on its fourth fund, about 400 million AUM, so assets under management. So basically what we're, we're, we're investing in. I haven't been part of the fund for uh, over almost four years now, almost five, as I stepped out to basically go do Exer. But when we were starting Signia, it was all about early stage investing. So it's all, Brian, back to what you were what you were saying around, okay, great. We're, we're having people come and pitch us that don't even have a product, right? They just have a, they have a right. business plan, right? Or they have an idea or they have a, maybe they have a prototype. And so to me, at least it's like, there's, there's two, there's two components to it. One is have a thesis, right? Like I'm investing in this kind of thing. And so at least for Signia, the the thesis was I'm investing in disruptive technologies that are going to go after really big incumbent markets and try and disrupt them. So that could be Mm. um, autonomous vehicles disrupting the car industry. That could be uh, virtual reality disrupting employee training. That could be crypto, but but uh, uh, like a infrastructure picks and shovels disrupting and making Ethereum and Bitcoin more effective, right? As a, and cheaper to use mm-hmm. than all the gas fees, et cetera. So have have a thesis, right, to set out because then it's easier, much easier to say no. You you always have like a little pot, which is probably your friends friends and family pot, right? Which is like, all right, cool. Default, I'm just going to, I just tend to default. I write 25 paychecks to any friend that's starting a company because it's like, if they win, I win. If they lose, I don't care. It's fine. So that that's sort of like my default pot. And then for the bigger investments, my thesis, and then usually a lot of it is, is signals, right? So um, are there other great co-investors, right? So that's obviously uh, when you're super early on, there may not be any other investors. So you might be the first. And at, at, at my shop, we were trying to be the first investor. But the other signals are pedigree, right? So have they done this before? Has the team worked in here before? Have they done customer interviews? Do they know, do they know the industry that they're getting into? Is there some sort of IP slash, doesn't have to be like a patent necessarily, but something that makes them stickier and different and harder for two other people in a garage to go start? So those are the kind of signals that I typically look for. And then I, I created templates because the, the one thing I hated as an entrepreneur was talking to investors and then they're just, I, I guess now we call it ghosting, right? But like, just them never getting back to me. <laughs> <laughs> now, now it's just ghosting. <laughs> so I don't know when that became a thing, but it is. Uh, so <laughs> so I've been ghosted plenty of times and what I felt like was not on that level. Different, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a different story. So I just try and have like a template, which is basically like, Hey, I, I, this is not the right investment for me. And I always try and give some sort of feedback around why, why it wasn't. And so at least they can come back. And last thing I'll say on this was one of my, the biggest metrics for me as an investor, when I was on that side of the house for success was how many deals w- were being sent to me by entrepreneurs that I had actually said no to. Because I treated them fairly, honestly, uh, thoughtfully throughout the process. 
They knew it wasn't the right fit for me, but they knew what I was looking for. And so when they had a friend that came and said, hey, I'm working on this thing, they're like, you know what? You should go talk to Zaw. He didn't invest in this in us because of X, Y, Z, but he he was forthright and gave us great feedback and you know uh, helped us through the process. And but he is looking for stuff like you. And so that that was always my big barometer for success on that end. A question for you guys though: I'm curious from your perspectives as you get all these different things thrown at you. Do you typically, uh, you know, for the 78 percent of people that come out of the leagues? there's typically a business advisor or someone, right? That's like works with your agent or someone before, or is it just a free for all? No. Okay. Yeah. It's a free for all because your agent doesn't really know. Agents aren't involved in venture. Their job is to get you and land you the contract. Typically I would say with everything that I know now in terms of the financial world, most NFL players go with big wirehouses. Um, I'm not a fan of wirehouses in terms of, um, because they only pitch their their products or, you know, if you're with a Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan Chase, like they're going to pitch what's on their platform and they're going to steer you away from investments that haven't been vetted by their people. The way I look at things now is I have like an investment committee if I am going to write a check for anything and I will run it by the industry experts because that that I know that are in my network that I can call friends in terms of, hey, I'm looking at this what do you think? And if Mm. they think it's interesting, number one, to where they would write a check or the family office that they work for or are a part of would write a check, then that gives me, to your point, Zaw, that's a signal. Mm -hmm. Um, And I will actually go through the deck with them and help try to get these reps and understanding. I know it's going to take me about at least on the fast end, maybe five years to get average and then 10 years to be great at looking at companies and doing it by myself. Mm-hmm. So you put in those 10,000 hours, right? On, exactly. And I'm going to be leaning on an investment committee. And even people who do it well, Zah, you obviously know this in terms of venture capital. You have these general partners who still have an investment kit committee to help them go through it because they have a lens and then they have to widen their lens and get the opinions and of, of other people because they're also investing other people's money. So- that's how I think about it. Ryan, how about you? Free for all, just like Benny said, and here's some of the components people miss, right? I mean, you're talking about, I, I had a teammate who right after when he got to the NFL, actually we were teammates in college too, he got the NFL and found out his parents had racked up a bunch of credit cards in his name. So he had like a 500 credit score. And, he, you know, so, so there's like one pocket. And then this just the immediate change of everyone around you. Like I'm sure is all for you. There was mm-hmm. either a fund or an event that everybody then was coming to you. And so, but for, for an NFL player, you literally get drafted. I got drafted. And before I got home from the press conference, my uncle had sent me a deck for a real estate development, which to your point, he had never <laughs> done it before. And it was the entire amount of my first contract. And I'm like, what what and I love my uncle, right? But like you're you're dealing with people who are not logical. And then lastly, there is zero collective knowledge and education about financial literacy. I am one of the many players who lost their first one million dollars, and it was because I didn't say no. It's because I didn't have a theory. Like I love that you said theory, have a thesis, because that that that's what helped me recently and through towards the end of my career is I'm an income investor, right? I've had my event. I'm not investing unless I'm making money Q1 or month one. That's just not what I'm going to do, right? And so that thesis has helped me, to your point, say, look, I love this idea, but I only invest in things that produce income because I'm a retiree. I need income. I don't need growth. And then lastly, being able to just say no, right? Like, no, you can't get this. You can't do this. And the, But again, the amount of money that professional athletes make I didn't know about a family office. How is there no athlete financial family office, so to speak, where, hey, I can come come in as an athlete. We understand my earnings horizon and this is going to be my game plan or I'm going to use a lawyer and an accountant from the group because I didn't know I needed a lawyer and accountant. Because guess what? No one in my family has a lawyer and accountant. We know H&R Block, right? So you're just there's just all this stuff coming in as a player. And, yeah. then by, and then if you're lucky, you get to survive. It. I mean, look, business opportunity, though, business opportunity. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, I'm saying it. I'm like, you know, Zal might be able to figure this out, you know, talking to the penny jar folks, you know, like Steph's, you know, Steph's crew. You're talking to and, Rich. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you're Steph, right, and you, you're deep in this culture of Silicon Valley, you know, and you've got Steph's contracts, 
you can afford to have, you know, a, a team that's basically surrounding you. But for the most part, you don't want to go paying two and 20 or paying salary for someone that's going to be handling it. But uh, some sort of exactly what you're describing, some sort of firm that like can help people vet investments, isn't trying to push, you know, to Benny's point, isn't trying to push their own products, right? Just like, oh, you should be in this ETF and you should be in this, uh, you know, this fund. And that, and it's all just the stuff that's coming out of their book and they're getting points on it, right? So the incentives are all messed up. I mean, it, it sounds like someone should set that up. Not, not me, I don't know how to do that, but. There are some out there, but Zah, I think, and Ryan double clicked on this, but Zah, the thesis is super important. Peyton was speaking at a YPO event and he gets pitched a lot of different investments. And then he also gets pitched a lot of different things in terms of philanthropy. And the way he has it in, the way he does it with philanthropy is, hey, my family and I are committed to this. This is what we are committed to for this year. And he was just talking about his schedule and what he says yes to. And he's like, everybody thinks that I'm super busy, but no, it's actually just fit around my family thesis and my mission statement to what I will say yes to. So it's easy for him to say yes to things. And then he politely declines other things. Hey, this just isn't right for me right now. And, you know, people have to to go with that. So, so I think that's that's incredible in terms of just looking at investment and just even open up the conversation even more. But I would like to go back and dive into going back to Stanford Business School. Then you what did you learn in Stanford Business School? And then talk about your next company after that. Stanford Business School was really interesting because I was obviously a lot younger than most of my classmates. And so a lot of them had been, at that point, they'd been out of out of school five, six, seven years, sometimes even more, right? I had just, you know, basically what I did was freshman year at Stanford and then dropped out for two years and then did senior year at Stanford and was lucky enough to be able to finish undergrad in those just those two years plus some summer stuff um, and some stuff I'd done in high school. So I went straight in. So I was used to like taking tests and reading books. And for, for the majority of them, thankfully Stanford and still is today was on like a uh, basically a pass or no pass system. And so you got, there's like a couple different, I can't remember all the different versions of it, it was like high pass, pass, low pass and fail or something like that. And so you just had to maintain, there was no GPA. So you just had to get a certain number of uh, not fails and then you were fine. They they did, they did kick a couple people out though that did not pass that, you know, they did use it seriously, but not, it wasn't, it wasn't super hard. And for me, it was just coming out of, you know, a senior year of college where it was like, I was grinding because I was trying to get done and graduate with my class. And so I was just used to it. So the school part was actually relatively easy. I had a lot of fun. It was really interesting. Um, I, I like the case study method. I learned a lot by, by kind of hearing these stories. I think it was a little different for me coming in, even though I was so young, I had spent the last two years doing a company and dealing with all these same problems. And so I was able to actually participate and relate to that, which was, if I hadn't done that, I think it would have been not as useful because it would just wouldn't have you know, had the same impact. Um, if I had to do it all over again, I would have probably played more golf because my golf game is slow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've been trying to get Benny to golf. So yes. thank you. I'm telling him, yeah. like, you never I mean, meet a broke golfer. It doesn't happen. That, I mean, they were at the driving range every day because they were, this was like a two year break for them. It was business school. They, they had been grinding at some private equity shop or, Bain or McKinsey or something for like five years. And the, this was like a vacation for them. And it's Stanford. So it was like really like a nice vacation. So they were, they were sailing. They were, you know, we, uh, that was the yacht club. I was a part of the yacht club, but they were playing golf. They were, you know, all, all the, all the stuff. And I, I think golf is one of those things if you don't do it early on in life, you just, it becomes more and more difficult the older that you get. And so I don't know, I'm horrible now and you think like <laughs> i just it's really bad we can play together then yeah yeah exactly Any, if, if it's a scramble we're playing best ball i'm i'm all in uh but anything else it's yes. it's uh, frustrating <laughs> so i would have done that i would have paid more attention in accounting that was probably the the one thing where as a startup you know not dealing having to deal with a lot of revenue and recognition and customer contracts you know when you're just building something for consumers you know, it didn't probably speak as much to me and now being able now actually obviously dealing with that at scale and looking at it and and just understanding kind of the basics of really what that means and and how to manage cash flow and how to how to forecast um, appropriately and and model it all out like that that to me was probably the the biggest one where if i had to go back and do it all again i, I would pay more attention there 
And then I, I went and did startups most of the time. I was working probably 40, 50 hours a week. It was actually, there were two uh, of us that were the idiots that were working during business school. It was myself. And then it was Prague who was working for the 49ers. And so he was doing a bunch of their early cap table draft analysis, uh, sort of money ball for, for the NFL. And then I was doing social networking startups. Please forgive me for not knowing the name, but you built the piping for, was it AT&T? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was, so that was right after, right after business school, I would, had been at one of the early social networking companies. I was very similar to LinkedIn, but it was like an enterprise version. So uh, it was a company called Spoke and it was fantastic. It was just ahead of its time. Um, and I, for whatever reason, thought in 2004, when I was coming out of business school, that the social networking wars were kind of done, right? Like MySpace was there. Friendster was still around. Google had that, oh my God, what was it called? Orchid. It was horrible. It was like all Brazilian <laughs> <laughs> something. It was, it was fun to go on there, but it was, uh, they all spoke Portuguese. So it didn't really help. Uh, you know, Facebook hadn't really taken off yet. Uh, LinkedIn was still obviously in its really early days. So to me, I was looking at mobile and I was like, this, this is the next opportunity. This is pre iPhone, right? So iPhone wasn't even out yet. That was 2007. And as, as Benny alluded to back again, this is going to date me, but like back in those days, early on 2000, you know, 2002, 2003, going into 04, if we were on different carriers, we couldn't send text messages to each other, right? It was very, very difficult. Or it was that really horrible, you know, sort of, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. they went through from Verizon to AT&T, sometimes they didn't. You had no idea. And it, it's why I think so many of us had uh, back then had Blackberries because Blackberry Messenger worked across every every carrier. So, um, you know, they miss BBM. They, I miss BBM, man. They had me for a while. <laughs> um, we basically went to all the carriers and said, hey, we're going to create help create this new set of things called short codes. Um, we're going to build these pipes that allow people to send text messages back and forth. Uh, we're going to then on top of those pipes open it up to allow other companies to send messages through. So it's not just consumers, but it could be, this is at the time when they were really big. So Yahoo, AOL, Zynga, the NBA, the NFL, um, we opened up all these pipes for all the different um, enterprise messaging as well as the consumer messaging. And at one point, um, I don't know what it is today, but at one point about 25% or so of the text messaging traffic in the U S was running through our pipes. Um, a lot. And these are digital pipes for those of us who are just maybe low, but these are digital pipes that you're making in codes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But in some ways, the, the funny thing is I, we, we call them pipes because they actually kind of, they were in some ways like a, a, a digital version of a pipe, but with a fiber optic backbone. And so what you would do is this is before AWS in the cloud. Again, I'm going to sound so old now, but so back then we had to like we had to go stick servers in racks at these co-location facilities. And these things had, I mean, they were like nuclear missile silos, like high-end security, right? Because they didn't want anyone coming and messing with that data, screwing up the internet. You had to go in in a clean room with like booties and a hat on, and it'd be freezing cold. You'd be sitting there trying to like get your server to work and like shaking at the same time because they were so cold in there. And so we, we had to put these boxes in and so, and then connect them with fiber optic to a set of boxes that were going to be in Seattle or Kansas City or wherever the big centers were for the major carriers. So in a way, they were pipes, but they were made out of fiber, fiber optic cables. <laughs> well, hey, man, you've been creating all kinds of solutions. And your most recent one is Exer AI. You've been called a mobile baron by publications. What went into the decision to create the AI company and where does, and what does Exer, what problem does Exer solve? Yeah, I think about, so Exer to me is just an extension of mobile um, and kind of the work that I've been doing in mobile for so long. My co-founder and CTO was the, uh, was the first mobile engineer at Twitter when they first got started. I think he was, he knows the exact number, but I, he's like employee number 30 um, from in their early days. And so he's been an expert on, mobile application development, AI on the edge. And to me, what, what, you know, when we first, asked, when we first started Exeter, the idea was basically, Hey, why, why do people have to wear straps and hardware 
or go into these really expensive gate labs with all these million dollar cameras and sensors that they have to put on their body. Can we not use devices that people already have, whether it be a phone or a tablet to actually see the human body and then be help able to coach them through motion to assess how they're doing, et cetera. And so that was the very, very first beginning uh, back in 2018 when we first started um, doing this and we got it working basically on the edge, meaning we don't send videos to the cloud and come back down. Everything runs directly on a device and it sees your body in real time, not with, without any straps, not any wearables. Um, and then from there, we can assess basically what people are doing. And there's a lot of different applications for it. So our mission as a company, going back to this idea of having mission-driven companies, is help the world move, train, and play better. And uh, I think we're really still, we're, we have lots of opportunities in train and play, but right now, at least, we're really focused on the move part which is really around health. Mm -hmm. And so how do we help people that are going through uh, big musculoskeletal problems, whether that be surgery, whether that be a movement disorder um, like uh, Parkinson's or cerebral palsy or stenosis, or how do we people, help people with chronic low back problems? How do we help elderly from, you know, prevent them from falling, um, give them programs that, you know, increase their, uh, their likelihood that they won't fall, so fall prevention. So there's all these different clinical pathways that we've then built on top of this AI. And so really it's just, it's an extension of the work that I've been doing in mobile for so long. It just, it has, it's a different industry, right? It's taking this full circle disruptive technology, which is AI and these computer vision models, these neural nets that we run on phones or tablets and applying them to a very, very, what's the polite way to say this, a, a very broken industry in healthcare where there's a lot of waste and there's a lot of problems. And maybe if we had known how difficult it was, we would have chosen something else. But that's the, you know, typical entrepreneur just bang your head against the wall a thousand times until you break through and then you find another wall and you bang it again. That's what we kept doing. And so we're doing that in healthcare, um, big incumbent industry, disruptive technology, trying to make, you know, a real change in the world. And we're, we're just starting to get there. So, it, you know, we've been in stealth mode for a couple of years and, in the, in the last basically 18 months, you know, 24 months, it really started to actually grow the company. So you won't see it as a consumer necessarily because we're prescribed by doctors, but um, as, as we continue to grow, hopefully more and more people become exposed to it. To the moon you go, my friend, to the moon you go. You know, just as, 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 we, as we wrap up this conversation, as you being a successful entrepreneur, as you being a successful investor, What's what's one key piece of advice that you would want to share with an entrepreneur? If you had to just give them one piece of advice, what would you share with an entrepreneur right now who's building a company? Go talk to customers. I think to me, and you don't have to take all the feedback because people will ask you for a bunch of crazy things. But I think a lot of the times where, where I always see companies, uh, the overarching pattern where I see them fail is when they're building technology and then going off and looking for a market and they're like oh i built this cool thing and then oh let's go figure out where we're going to use it and they never find a great application because they never got to the pain point of someone that was actually willing to pay for that whether that be a consumer or a business so if you're out but if you're out talking to people you know they're going to give you a lot of crazy ideas but if you talk to enough people you'll start to distill down the things that are real problems and that you can actually provide a solution for using your technology. And so that is my biggest piece of advice is just get out there, go talk to customers. The more people that you talk to, the more pattern recognition you'll have and the better products you'd be able to build and the better and the bigger company you'll, you'll be able to start. So I'll leave you with that. Well, and then for me, my last one, give us one book you recommend that we read to that maybe open our minds or help us understand the concepts or pattern recognitions in life or business. This is going to be a little bit out of left field, but I think it it um, it will serve its purpose. There are tons of amazing business books and books that talk about you know sort of uh, breaking down patterns, right? Whether it be Blank or you know any any of the Gladwell books, et cetera, just understanding kind of those kind of things. What I like to do is actually try and read stuff that that is outside of the norms of like a typical business book that you know, kind of like opens up my mind and allows me to think about things in different ways. And I'll give you, um, I'll give you two examples and I'm going to totally blank on the name of the first one, but it's, it's, it's by this guy named Dick Couch 
Um, and it's the story of, of uh, Bud's class, like 223 or something. I'll look it up. I'll send it to you guys. We'll put it in the notes. Um, but it's basically he follows an entire um, SEAL trainee class all the way through Bud's and understanding what he's trying to get out of it is basically like, what are the traits that allow people to get through Hell Week, right? So what what actually separates, is it physical? It's not physical attributes because there's some of the, like the strongest people that, that quit really early on in that process. What are the traits to for, for that person that allow them to get through that, you know, week of no sleep and crazy PT and everything else and surf torture and sitting in cold water. So, so that was like mind opening to me in terms of like, just understanding that a lot of it is about mindset and not necessarily about like um, some sort of knowledge or skill base or physical attributes. That was one. And then the last one I'll leave you with is um, a short history of nearly everything by Bill Bryson. And it sounds a little crazy, but it, it basically breaks down all these monumental different occurrences in, uh, in the, the history of the universe. Uh, so it's like, how did DNA get formed? How did, how, how are stars, how are stars made? And every one of them is this little chapter and this little snippet, but that uh, oh, you can read all of them totally separately or you can read it all back to back. But to me, it, it always serves as a reminder of like, there are all of these big, really crazy things that have happened in the history of our universe. And we're this like tiny little speck, you know, in this, in, on the, in this huge, you know, billion years of continuum of, of time we're we're making this little, we're, we're, we're right here on this line. How do you actually leave the world as a better place, you know, and make your impact on that timeline? You're never going to maybe be a chapter in this book, but how, you know, it's what I always talk to my boys about, like, are you a, are you a sheepdog? Are you a sheep? Or are you a wolf? How do you be a sheepdog and leave the world as a better place and take care of other people um, as you're doing it? So that I'll leave you with that. It, it's a very non-obvious business book, but a one that I think helps people remember that there's something bigger and important that you got to be a part of. Love it. Was finishing school, the school by Dick couch. Is that what you're saying? Finishing school. Is that yeah. it? All right. Uh, there, yeah, I think it's that one. There's one before that, actually. Um, I think it's called the making of finishing schools. The second, it's called the warrior elite the right. forging of steel class. Oh, I was close. Two, two, eight, not two, two, three warrior elite. Zothet, everybody. Zoth, man, really appreciate you coming on the Gridiron and Growth Podcast with Ryan and myself. Man, this is an incredible conversation. We've learned a tremendous amount. We would love to invite you back as you continue to grow and scale Exer. Um, if there's any ways that we can help, um, please let us know. But just want to say thank you, man, for taking the time. Absolutely. Appreciate you, gentlemen, and look forward to seeing you soon. Oh.